Ruth, I've lost my voice. You're preaching today.
wanted to make an announcement. Cordell Klein, are you here? Okay. Is that you, Cord, back there? Okay, come on up. Good morning. And welcome to First Presbyterian Church, Texas County, Arkansas. We're glad if you're here in the sanctuary, and we're glad if you're watching on the podcast at home. It's good to have you with us, and we hope that you will join with us in enthusiastically worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we have uh, uh, a man by the name of, he just wandered in the church, Cordell Klein. He wants to make an announcement. So, all in favor of letting him announce, okay. Okay, come on up, Corey. We continue to monitor the Centers for Disease Control, and uh, I am delighted to tell you that uh, the Monday uh, update, which uh, of course we'll have no one tomorrow, but last week, the uh, recommendations for the CDC finally have changed. The uh, Transmission of COVID-19 in both Bowie and Miller County has been downgraded to low. And consequently, they are removing the recommendation that we wear masks indoors. And on Tuesday of last week was the first time in over two years that there were no COVID-19 cases at St. Michael Hospital. Of course, it will not be a... It will not be official until session meets after worship today, but the worship committee is recommending to the session that we remove the mask mandate and that we go back to passing the collection plate and go back to uh, our standard communion service. Thank you. Thank you, Cord. That's good news indeed. But I would like to add a couple codicils. Uh, another variant of Omicron is going through China and Asia right now and beginning in uh, Europe. So don't be surprised if we have to go back and turn that around in the future. But for now, we're going to do the best we can the way we used to be. That reminds me to announce that session meets this afternoon right after church. Are there any other announcements or items we need to discuss here? Okay, those of you who were here last Sunday or who watched on the podcast were, were able to see my annual rant against the daylight savings time change and having to go back and forth and how the extra hour of sunlight kills grass and so forth. But we... So, so I, I do this at wherever I am every year. I do this silly rant before worship begins. Did it last Sunday. Imagine my surprise. This is true. Imagine my surprise last Tuesday or Wednesday, watch, Wednesday watching the news on uh, public television right out of Judy Woodworth, Woodward, Woodward's mouth came the Senate is accepting and going to work on a bill to make daylight savings time permanent. And the House also has such a bill in front of it. Wow. You know what that says to me? We have far more people watching this pod. Every senator in the United States Senate is obviously watching this church service. So senators, thank you very much for your uh, watching this service and for making, for acting on it, just as I mentioned last week. See, you never know about the power of communication. Okay, did I say welcome to everybody? I guess I did. So let's continue and begin the worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you. 
Let's read responsively the call to worship found in the bulletin. Come, let our hearts be turned with praise toward the Lord. The Lord is merciful and with the love of a parent calls us to return home. Yet through the grace of Jesus Christ, we are welcomed home. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, in your divine mercy, you have given us the season to bring forth fruit for your kingdom. Cultivate us, Lord, that we may produce good fruit in the time we are given. Amen. Please be seated. I see we have a young person with us this morning. Would you like to come down for a 20 minute sermon? No. Would you like to come forward or not? It's okay. We have another? Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yes. I, uh, yes, both come down. Come down, please. Yes, yes, yes. Milo and... Hi, hi Milo. I've talked to you before. And tell me your name again. Ashley. Ashley. Oh, I like that name. Milo and Ashley. That sounds like a television show of some nature. Did you all ever have a television show? Yeah. Oh, you did? Was it called Ashley and Milo or Milo and Ashley? You forgot. Okay. Okay. Ah, uh, well, have you ever had anything bad happen to you? Did you ever fall down on your bicycle? No. You did? Three times on the bicycle. I may have fallen even four times on the bicycle. Okay, you haven't fallen down then in a long time. That's good. When you fell down, did it hurt? Oh yeah. Listen, I have listen, it's I have the same thing here. It's really I fell down while walking the other day. And these pants are tight. Look at that. See? I bullied it too with me. Yeah, yeah, we both had the same problem. So it hurt. So, I bullied while I was walking on the road while I was meeting my teacher. You were walking to meet your teacher. She didn't knock you down, did she? Okay, good, okay. Well, we all have problems and we all have accidents. You didn't really plan, to actually, to fall down on your bicycle, did you? But it hurt. And, and sometimes we wonder, oh, why did this happen? Why did this have to happen? 
And that's certainly what I thought when I fell. Why did this have to happen? Of course, it was on the knee where I'd had the knee surgery, so that all makes sense. But the thing is, we don't always know when something's going to happen that's good or bad. So in our lives, sometimes we have good things happen. Sometimes we have bad things happen. When you fell, who helped you? Did somebody pick you up? Your grandma. Your grandma. Yeah. She was there as kind of an angel, wasn't she? Who helped you when you fell? I can't remember. You can't remember. My brother your, your brother helped too. Anybody help you at all? I can't remember. Can't remember. I bet somebody did. I bet somebody was very good to you when you fell. Probably was your mother. That's right. I guess so. Well, at any rate, in our lives, we all have good things and bad things happen. And when bad things happen, why, why does this happen? But when good things happen, sometimes we forget to say thank you for that, for the good things that happen. So we have both good things and bad things happen in all of our lives. Who do we have, who can we thank when when good things happen often for, for being kind to us. We can thank Jesus and God, can't we? Yes, very good, very good. Uh, now, God allows some things to happen in life that we don't always understand, but God still has mercy and help for us when those bad things do happen. So, that's just my thought for you today, and I'm glad that you're here. Would you like me to pray for you? Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, we pray for the children. Be with them, bless them, and keep them through all their hurts and all the good things that happen to them in their lives. Thank you for your many gifts. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I got to remind everybody, this is the guy that picked the Super Bowl winner. Remember? Did you follow his uh, instructions? He said, vote for the goats. That was as close as we could get to the rams, so... Okay, okay. You collect now. So everybody's shaking their head out there. You go out and get a dime from them because <laughs> cause they made money on your, uh, your uh, I'm just kidding. He's looking at me like, really? <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Let's confess our sins before God, first in silence and then together. Let us pray. Lord, we know that we are not without sin, but our lives seem inadequate without the need of repentance. Forgive us for wanting to be Christians without hearing the fruit of Christian living. Forgive us for the superficial expression of the Christian way. Enable us to turn around in our living and begin a new life with Christ, our Redeemer, in whose name we pray, Amen. Friends, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Christ Jesus, our sins are forgiven. be seated. Today's text on this third Sunday of Lent is, uh, is really a strange one. Luke has some strange gospel lessons in Lent. This is one of them. It's a rather hard one. Luke chapter 13 verses 1 through 9. Please listen for the word of the Lord. At that time, there were some presents who present who told him about the Galilean whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. 
He asks them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were worse offenders than all other living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will perish just as they did. Then he told them a parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it, and he found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I've, been, I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I still find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting soil? He, meaning the gardener, replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Let's pray. O oh Lord, open our hearts and ears for your word for us today. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. The people were leaving a Lenten service at a church in Maslin, Ohio, when one of the faithful older members of the congregation somehow fell down the outside flight of steps and broke her hip. Now just imagine the anxiety of the church over this injury. You know, this is a beloved person. She, my God, she's fallen at church. She's broken a hip. To make matters worse, she did not recover from the hip surgery, and she died a few days later. The pastor of the church, Maurice White, ministered to the family during this tragedy. He stood with the bereaved husband for a while during the visitation. Many people came in to offer their sympathies, and they all gave their best advice and words of comfort to the husband, and the pastor overheard all of them. God must have some plan for this, so accept it, said one. This is God's will, so we must live by it, said another. God planned this to test your faith, so you must be strong. And one more. There's a silver lining to every cloud. You will find God's reason behind all this eventually. Pastor White left the funeral home angry. He was filled with strong emotion at all what he called the babbling that had occurred that evening. So he went to his study and he rewrote the first part of his funeral sermon. The next day, White began his sermon this way. My God does not push old ladies down church steps. Then he proceeded to explain that God cannot be blamed or accused for all the brokenness in the world. In our text from Luke, Jesus comes up against a similar situation. They ask him about a, a recent rather horrible thing. Have you heard about the massacre at the temple where Pilate slaughtered the Galileans who were there and as they worshiped and their own blood mingled with the blood of the sacrifices? This is about as bad a thing as you can think of if you're an active Jew at that time. My God, this is horrible. Why would God let anything like this happen to these faithful people at this holy place? Where was God when all this was happening? Jesus seemed to know what they were thinking. He anticipated one of their questions by asking, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? He knew that there was a connection in the minds of many of these people between sin and tragedy. If they experienced something so tragic, it had to be a result of their sin. Now, 
I kind of wish Jesus had taken the opportunity to explain the problem of evil to us, but uh, he, he did not. He, he could have explained why God allows evil to occur. But no, Jesus does not do this. He did make one thing clear that we all need to hear. Were these people killed worse than all other sinners? No, no, I tell you. And then he adds, adds a puzzling phrase. But unless you repent, you will perish just as they did. Wow. Next, then, on his own, Jesus brings up the problem of providence. Or he says those 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were worse than all others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. So here we have two situations, one caused by human beings and the other one caused by chance. The first example, clearly caused by the uh, soldiers of Pilate, humans caused the injustice that occurred. But in the second, when the tower falls, we're left guessing what killed the 18 people. Was it a strong wind? Was it an old building? Was it an earthquake? Or was it just merely chance? Both situations cry out for an answer. Why, God, why do you let such things happen? Why sickness? Why storms? Why tornadoes? Why Russians going into the Ukraine? Why all this? Why, God, why? Jesus makes clear that suffering does not come about because people are bad or sinful. Suffering, he says, is part of this world. It's part of the world. Jesus' response is frustrating because uh, he doesn't say, he does uh, because of what he does not say. What he says is good. He makes clear that we must not assume tragedy is the fault of the victims. But don't you wish you could talk just a little bit more about things? You see, there's a deep, deep need in each of us to make sense of life. We want to make sense of life. We would like a mathematical equation, mathematical certainty about our lives. Math, you know, one plus one equal two, two plus three equal five, Four plus seven is 11. Always works that way, no matter how many times you add it up. There's a comfort to this in knowing you can add up things and they always work out the same way. Why can't we do that with life? Hmm. Something like this. Attending Sunday school plus Bible reading equals God's blessing. Sounds good. Serving as an elder plus helping in a habitat build equals no divorce. Giving to the Gideons plus chaperoning the youth lock-in equals no cancer. Those all sound like fair deals to us, don't they? Yeah, why not? But we all know there are no such mathematical equations in life. And we complain to God when life doesn't add up the way we want it to. Why do the evil prosper and why did the good get struck down? Well, these are the questions I want Jesus to answer. But no, he doesn't answer it. Instead, he adds this message of judgment about it, sounding like a hellfire and damnation for those who question. Unless you repent, you will perish just as they did. What sense do we make of all that? But Jesus knew the most important question was not why, but what now? Jesus wants us to be the kind of Christians who have faith when life is good and faith when life is bad. To be the same Christians when our, when our son live, wins the lottery and when our brother is killed in an airplane crash. Your mathematical equations, your philosophical questionings about your faith in good times only don't get you very far Instead of asking the unanswerable questions about your fate, you need to repent and make sure you have a solid relationship with God. Or you too are going to perish. Repent or perish. It is a sobering message. Ah, but after this, 
Then Jesus adds his note of grace in the parable that follows. The story of the farmer who planted the fig tree and gave it the normal three years to grow and produce figs, but it did not. None were found. So the farmer finds it. He's unhappy with it. He says to his gardener, tear it up, throw it away, get it out of here and plant a tree that will grow figs. But the gardener pleads for one more chance. Give it another chance. I'll, I'll fertilize it. I'll, I'll dig around it some more. Give it one more year to produce fruit. If it does, well and good. If it doesn't, well, we can just throw it away, cast it out. The tree by the farmer, the farmer gives that tree a second chance. Jesus tempers judgment with grace. God gives us all another chance and another chance, and another chance, and another chance, and another chance. We get lots of chances. Look at the Bible. From the beginning to the end of the Bible, God is depicted as a God who is quick to show mercy and slow to judgment. Moses, Moses is given a chance after killing a man Simon Peter is given a second chance after denying Christ three times. Saul is given a second chance after persecuting Christians, meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus, and becoming the Apostle Paul. We are all given a second chance, a second chance and another second chance, again and again and again, just as well. Have any of you read the writer Annie Lamott? Any of you? Familiar with Annie Lamont? Okay, good. You know what I'm talking about. Annie is a Presbyterian, and, and I highly encourage you to read some of her books. She lives in the San Francisco area. She's a latecomer to the Presbyterian Church, but very active now, and writes from a, often a unique Christian perspective. At any rate, Annie tells of going to visit her best friend in the hospital, who was dying of cancer. At some point, as Annie just chatted on without thinking, she said to her fat friend, Pammy, do you think I look fat in this dress? A couple seconds went by and her friend said, Annie, you don't have that kind of time. I think Jesus is saying, if you're sitting here today, it's because of the mercy of God, the mercy of God. The time you have, the life you live, it's not under the judgment of God, but under God's mercy. So use it. Use it. Amen. Let's stand and say what we believe. The Apostles' Creed is found in the book. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And thence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please be seated. Sang nicely. And you ought to sing nicely. That's a hymn by John Calvin. As far as we know, the only hymn by John Calvin, but it's by him. So there. We turn now to the offering, and I've got to remember to say we actually don't take up an offering here. We have offering plates on each side of the sanctuary, and we have one at the back. So you can either visit all three or put your uh, offering in the, the one you like the best. However, that's not going to preclude us from having an uh, uh, offertory anthem. So I turn it now over to Michael and the choir. Let's pray. Generous God, may we give because giving is like you. May we share because truth is multiplied by sharing. May we do this because you love a cheerful giver. May this offering be used effectively to expand your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. First of all, this is for the choir. I hear a lot of choirs in a lot of places, mostly in Arkansas Presbytery, just a few in 
Pines Presbytery, but I have to say that, you know, this is the best choir I've ever heard in Pines Presbytery. <laughs> and you're always welcome to come and rehearse with them and join. They'll be glad to, uh, they'll be glad to take you on. Let's turn our hearts and minds now toward God with the prayers of the people and the Lord's Prayer. Merciful God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace and in the renewal of our lives. Help us to become instruments of your saving love. Heavenly Father, preserve us from worldly anxieties. Take from us the anger and the fears that keep us from living fully as disciples. Have mercy, O God, upon the sick, that they may obtain sleep and relaxation, allowing the healing powers of nature to do their best. Help us as we battle the COVID virus. Help those who suffer from it. Strengthen all professional medical people who treat those afflicted by it. God, whose mercy never fails, we commend to you all who have a place in our hearts and sympathies, all who are joined by us to sacred ties, all little children who are dear to us, all neighbors and friends, all who help us live a faithful life, ever pour upon them your blessing. Master of all peoples, who commands us to love one another, Grant to the rulers and people of our own and every land a vision to look beyond national boundaries and ambitions that they may bring gifts and treasures to promote unity of all people. Protect the innocent, the hungry, wherever they suffer. We pray today especially for peace and a just and quick end to the war in the Ukraine. Please protect the innocents there, the non-combatants. Guide and direct, O oh Lord, the minds of all who work to shape your church. Restore our faith and vision, renew our energies and love. Revive your people to this new life and power so that we may live and speak the word of Christ in the world that he came to save. We come to you now, Lord, with our own silent meditations. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Okay, one other brief sermon. You can stay standing. I won't be back until Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday and, Chris, and Christmas and Easter Sunday, I'll be here. We're going to plan to do special kind of services those days. Okay, this is your opportunity to tell folks something different is going on at First Presbyterian. Come and be a part of it and see what's happening. I challenge you to do that so we might have a really great attendance on those two Sundays. Okay, I want to tell the session this with more later on, but you got the shortened version. Go from this place in peace, standing here not under the judgment of God, but under the mercy. Go therefore to love and serve the Lord. And now the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is upon us now and forevermore. And let all God's people say together, Amen. Amen.